Excellent. Thank you, Deborah. And it is so wonderful to be back online with everybody. This series got kicked off last spring in the wake of the pandemic. And big shout out to Professor Jean Theo Harris for helping launch this whole project. And we had our first session a couple weeks ago, and this is my first one back. So I'm really excited to be with you all this afternoon. Uh, so I wanna welcome everyone on, here on behalf of the Zen Education Project for our session on uh, Paul Robeson. And I think we're all going to, to be deeply enlightened about his legacy this afternoon. Some of you are joining us for the first time and some have participated in our spring series. It is a gift to be able to share this time together. And I just wanna thank you for being in this virtual community with us. My name is Jesse Hagopian. I'm a high school teacher. I'm an editor with Rethinking Schools and I work with the Zen Education Project. I'm helping to lead up our initiative called Teach the Black Freedom Struggle Campaign. And Rethinking Schools coordinates the Zen Education Project along with Teaching for Change. And so the Zen Education Project is hosting this session today and offers free downloadable people's history lessons. We, we won't sneak them under your door as we were charged with by the Trump administration, uh, but we will make them online and available for you to download. Um, and many of you have used these for middle and high school classrooms from the Zen Education Project website. We have a campaign uh, with many different components to teach the black freedom struggle that I urge everyone to check out. And um, this class is part of that campaign. So throughout the session, we want you to use the chat box. You can post questions in the chat box, comments, resources, ideas that you have about our topic. We will read your questions and then uh, Dr. Carr will try to respond to some of them after the, the breakout groups. So we'll do our best to answer as many questions as we can, but uh, we're not sure if we'll be able to get to everything. We um, will do a short evaluation at the end. So please don't leave before you've filled out the evaluation and you can always continue the conversation on Twitter. We encourage you to share what you're learning and your insights with the hashtag teach black freedom struggle. And, uh, now we're ready to, to launch our conversation. And after about 25 minutes, we'll pause so that you can meet each other in breakout groups and share your thoughts with one another. And so now I am thrilled to introduce you to Dr. Greg Carr, who insists I call him Greg. So I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna work on that. He's Associate Professor of Africana Studies, the Chair of the Department of Afro-American Studies at Howard University and adjunct faculty at Howard School of Law. Carr is the co-founder of the Philadelphia Freedom Schools Movement and is an advisor with the Zen Education Project Teach Reconstruction Campaign. Welcome, Greg. Appreciate you being here. Jesse, it's a real pleasure, brother. Um, long time follower of your work. And if you all are not familiar with that work, please, um, you, you got, you've got to get the publications and you've also got to get into the Teach the Black Freedom Struggle series. So it's an honor to be with you, brother, and always with Deborah and the whole family is in it. This is a, it's a oh, real honor. I'm looking forward to the conversation, man. Oh man, I can't tell you how much that means to me. Thank you so much. So uh, let's dig into this. I got to say like, Preparing for this interview has been so much fun to, to read about Paul Robeson's life again and listening to podcasts. And I'm just so immersed in his world. And I came across this incredible uh, clip of an interview with Paul Robeson. I thought we could start off with, and then I, I just want to ask you a question uh, related to it. So maybe Deborah can uh, queue up and, uh, and start it off. I'm proud for being African. Now, in our school books, they tried to tell me that all Africans were savages till I got to London and found most of the Africans I knew in, were going to Oxford and Cambridge and doing very well and, uh, and learned their culture. 
uh, and even once had, well, somebody had the temerity after one had had conquered the Chinese people and imposed upon them the opium trade and everything else to suggest that they were a backward people, just the people who had been civilized so long over the rest of you folks didn't make any sense at all. So somewhere uh, it was wonderful to find about the colored peoples of the world that they were very advanced. So I would say today that I'm an American who is infinitely prouder to be of African descent, no question about it. No. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Deborah. I mean, I just wanted you, I wanted everyone here to hear Paul Robeson's beautiful voice and just feel his energy for a moment. And, you know, to me, Paul Robeson is like the black Paul Bunyan, <laughs> or maybe, maybe Paul Bunyan is like the white Paul Robeson, because he's just such a legendary, larger than life figure, right? He was valedictorian at Rutgers University. Uh, he was a, an opera singer, right? I mean, uh, a stage actor, like Shakespearean stage actor and Hollywood actor, an, uh, a lawyer, uh, you know, played professional football in, in founding leagues of the NFL. I mean, I don't know how many languages he spoke, um, including African languages and Asian languages, leader in the black freedom struggle, anti-fascist, a socialist, a revolutionary. I just want to ask you, uh, Greg, what happens to our kids in our schools, to history class, to art class, to music class, to social studies and drama classes, uh, sports teams, when Robeson is left out of the narrative of our country? Jesse, first, thank you for playing that clip, brother and um, for allowing that ancestor to open the way for our, our all too brief conversation tonight. And, and, and like I said, I, I'll keep my end of our back and forth brief because um, the beautiful thing about this technology is it allows us to go global. So we don't have to worry about Paul Robeson getting on a, a transatlantic phone line to sing to the Welsh miners or standing at the Peace Arch in, in Washington State singing across to the folks in Canada. Everybody is here. Um, and because everybody is here, as folks were introducing themselves, we heard that there are a lot of people in this space who will be learning something about the Robesons for the first time, and a lot of people who know a great deal about the Robesons, which is what makes this convening so important. Um, our young people are people, period. Um, it reminds me of something that one of uh, Robeson's great influences, who he really looked up to, uh, the famous picture of them shaking hands in 1949 at the Paris Peace Conference, W.B. Du Bois. Uh, once said about, uh, you know, he said, you know, one of the great tragedies in the world is that people don't know enough about other people. Mm -hmm. And I think both Paul and Essie Robeson, his wife, his partner, um, really are two outsized examples of human possibility. Uh, and, and what our young people in engaging them get to, to see is two people who were human beings who's between their two bloodlines in terms of their families kind of encompass the history of the United States of America as a settler colony project and but they encounter them as people who while are seem like they couldn't be real for all they did right did it you know did it in a way that that really allows us to see that we all have that possibility I mean, that's the genius of the Robesons. That's the genius of Eslanda. That's the genius of Paul. When we when we just look through a little bit of their lives. Um, in fact, I'll end with this. Again, Du Bois, writing about Carter G. Woodson. When Woodson passed, he wrote one of the obituaries. And he said, you know, this life shows you what race prejudice can do to a human soul and what it's powerless to prevent. Mm -hmm. I think Paul Robeson and Eslanda Robeson show you, this is what you're up against, but this is what you can transcend if you just embrace our common humanity. So I'll, I'll, I'll end with there and we can just keep, you know, kind of. Hey, hey, that's beautiful, no doubt. And I'm reading this book, um, Paul Robeson, the artist <laughs> as revolutionary. My oh, man, Gerald Horn, got you, brother. Yes, sir. <laughs> and I love that, like, in the first chapter, is called The Best Known American in the World. And I just love that part where Time Magazine called him the most famous Negro in the world. And then uh, they were corrected that actually he was the the most well-known American in the world. It just blows my mind how few classrooms teach about the most famous person that existed at the time. 
uh, it, in America and how he's been a race. So thank you for bringing him back. And, uh, and, and also for bringing back Eslanda Robeson. I mean, she is erased from the textbooks completely as so many black women in history are today. Um, yet she was a towering figure of her own, right? An anthropologist, an author, an actress, a civil rights activist. Can you just say a couple things about her? Uh, and then and folks can read the, the book by uh, Barbara Ransby. Barbara Ransby, there it is. That's London. That's the one yeah. to get, right? Barbara Ransby's book. We got them, right? So, uh -huh. <laughs> and she, she is incredible. In fact, when you played that clip of Paul talking, it reminded me of this book. This is her book, African Journey. As Londa Good Robeson writes about the fact when they went to England, after they moved to England, she said she and Paul went looking for all the Africans they could find. She said they went in the in the alleys, they went in the universities, they went everywhere because she had started taking some classes. And she said, in America, we didn't learn anything about Africa. And she started with, I wanted to go to Africa. It began when I was quite small. That's where we're from. But then she says she was confronted by these uh, uh, folks in England saying, well, you don't know anything about the African. Uh, how could you know? And she said, well, this is what I feel. I, I am African. And they said, you're not African. You're European. And she fought back with the almost word for word what we heard Paul say in Australia. Essie is writing in the first two pages of African Journey, which is her travel log from traveling throughout Central and Southern Africa with Paul Jr. at the time. They're, they're in organizing women. Essie mm. Robeson. And just to you know, keep it very, very quick, Essie Robeson's people come out of South Carolina. Her grandfather, uh, Francis Cardozo, of course, has a school in D.C. named for him. They ran him out of South Carolina after locking him up for a year during Reconstruction for advancing uh, the, the rights of black people. He ends up a major educator in D.C. Then uh, his, his daughter, Essie's mother, is, is a brilliant kind of um, lay chemist, really which is what leads in some ways to Essie's interest. She becomes the first chemist on staff at Columbia Medical Center. And then when she and Paul, and she and Paul meet around that time, she decides to move from her career as a scientist to become his manager. And she's really, in many ways, the reason we even know Paul Robeson in any way. She's the one who manages his career and then decides after conversations with folk like Zora Neale Hurston in New York, I'm going to be an anthropologist. So she's writing book after book after book. and so. That's that line. And when you match it with Paul, whose, whose father escaped enslavement, <laughs> you understand? Oh, I should mention that, uh, yeah, whose father escaped enslavement, whose mother actually came out of a line that produced his mother's sister's daughter, who was, who was his first cousin, Sadie Tanner Mossel Alexander, out of Philly, whose people moved to D.C. So she could go to M Street High School, now Dunbar. This, mm -hmm. this convergence of these two human beings, it's <laughs> almost like, what can you throw against the human spirit and in response what can the human spirit do to demonstrate to the rest of us that nothing you throw at humanity needs to be endured if it's oppressive eslanda mm -hmm. robeson is remarkable and when she finally makes transition in 1965 paul lives another 10 years but in many ways as his son writes about um as their son paul jr writes about and even their granddaughter susan you know without essie it just becomes that much more difficult to manage. She's a, she, she is as much a, a citizen of the world as he is. Thank you, uh, you connecting so many dots for me. <laughs> and uh, now I actually, I gotta finish that book by, by Barbara Ransby. Well, she you. did, man, everybody's in there. Barbara Ransby did a towering job on this. <laughs> I'm like, oh, oh, I should mention, we know about Paul Robeson. We'll talk about that in a minute when he had to appear before the House Un-American Activities Committee. Essie Robeson has to appear before the Senate counterpart and McCarthy three years earlier. And she walks in there. And one of the things they first ask her is, did you write this book? She said, did I write this book? Oh, the shade she delivers. In fact, she says in this book, she says, I was actually working on something on the Mau Mau when I was interrupted and had to go testify at the Senate. <laughs> Meaning, what? <well, laughs> yo! <laughs> wow. Yeah, that's, so anyway. like, that's militancy. That's militancy, like, man. Militancy. 1953 <laughs> militancy. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That's, well, that, that leads me to my next question, because I want to talk about this McCarthy era that they both lived through and, and both were persecuted under. Um, you know, they faced re extreme repression uh, from the McCarthy era witch hunts and the HUAC. So how does McCarthyism disrupt struggles 
for racial and social justice, both both back then and and you know the the modern day versions of McCarthyism that we're struggling through today. Jesse, man, when you when you mentioned that that piece from Time that Gerald quotes, yeah, it's remarkable, isn't it, for this man to be one of the most recognized human beings in the world, arguably the most famous American in the world in nineteen in the mid mid nineteen forties, uh, records ballot for Americans. Does all this stuff extreme? You know, he and uh, Lloyd Brown, his partner, they go into the USO tours. I mean, he's doing all this work, and within the space of six, seven years, goes from doing a hundred thousand dollars a year and being this huge patriot, the NAACP gives him the Spin Guard Award, to maybe making two thousand dollars a year, singing in black churches, and being an enemy of the state. He and he and his wife's passports are taken. You put them with Louise Thompson Patterson and her husband, William Patterson, his friend, Shirley Graham, Du Bois, W.B. Du Bois. They make them into enemies of the state. And that small group of black kind of bourgeois leaders like Roy Wilkins and them, they like they turn their backs on them. Mm, this cool. really, I think it's really the confrontation we face today. Anytime you see global solidarity movements the fascist elements, and he called himself literally, said, I am an anti-fascist. So I guess if Paul Leslie Rosen were here today, they'd be labeled Antifa in some way. So, but, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Which actually kind of goes, I think, to, to spark uh, the beginnings of conversation around the question you raised, which is, what happens when ultra-nationalist movements, right movements, which have infiltrated, if, as if they were ever absent, the apparatus of the state, feel threatened by those who pick our common humanity over anybody's national or state interest, particularly finance capital, capitalism. And mm -hmm. so they had to come for them because at that time, as Gerald Horn writes other places, by the 1950s, the world is shrinking. These anti-colonial movements are going, and the United States is in a competition to try to sway global opinion to recruit some of these countries that are gaining and taking their independence onto their side. And they've entered the Cold War and Paul and S.E. Robeson become casualties. Mm -hmm. And they are attacked. And they're not only attacked by the apparatus of the state, by government, they're not only attacked by uh, the apparatus of uh, entertainment, where you know, all the bookings dry up except in the black venues. They're also attacked by those who should, they, who should be in solidarity with them. That's what Peekskill is about in 1949. I mean, you look at Peekskill where you got United States veterans fighting union folk. You got this anti-Semitic move, this anti-black move. And I'm saying... Is this Peace Kill 1945, uh, 1949, or was this uh, 16th Street Saturday night when everybody showed up <laughs> and the police stand by and watch people engage in wholesale warfare against human beings? The parallels are extremely striking. Finally, I think it really shows us this. Until we root out these anti-human, anti-humanity uh, tendencies in any government, they will not only persist, they will intensify. And I think we reached a point now where we just, we have to do something about this. And, and ropes, the lives of the ropes and show us what happens when you pick people over that kind of fascism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, thank you. No doubt. I mean, they were like the OG black identity extremists. That, <laughs> right. You Which, know. I would just have to say this. Ropes was born in 1898. So when they really start coming to consciousness, they're in their 30s. Right. So when Paul Robeson first starts talking about, I, I had no choice but to make my choice as an artist. Some people will say, well, that was then, you know, give young people time to grow. We all need time to grow. But Paul Robeson's like 38, 39 years old when he first makes that statement about the role of the artist. So I think one thing our young people, we don't necessarily do enough of, and you've got some master teachers in this room, is, and I think a lot of people do it, but there may be a few who don't do it as much, and I've been guilty of this, is, is, is help our young people understand the ages at which these folks were when they did what they did. Paul right. Robeson becomes a Broadway star in his 20s. He's like 24, 25 years old. He's a movie star by the time. So don't think about him and then look at movie stars now and say, well, that was different. He was a lot older. No, nah, he was actually younger than them. Yeah, <laughs> I, I appreciate that emphasis on how much young people have changed the world because you got you got to look at like the black panther party being founded by teenagers you know and like incredibly young folks building it or you know i mean king wasn't all that old himself and 
uh, a lot of a lot of these leaders were pretty young when they got started, and and making that visible for our youth, I, I like that lesson for sure. Um, excellent. Well, I mean that <clears throat> I want to continue in this vein of looking at the connections between Robeson's life and lessons we can apply today. So, because I think with white supremacy on the rise today, uh, what lessons can we take from Robeson's struggles against fascism? you know, for workers' rights. He was unapologetically for black liberation and for socialism, like for revolution in this country. And and I thought actually, Deborah, I think you have a, a song queued up. Maybe we could play this song before you, before you answer um, to show you like Paul Robeson's connection with the labor movement and the socialist movement. Like Joe Hill was a, was a hero of his from the IWW, the International Workers of the World. And he sings this song beautifully, uh, this tribute to Joe Hill. I dreamed I saw Joe Hill last night, alive as you and me. Says I, but Joe appeared ten years dead. I never died, says he. I never died, says he. In Salt Lake City, Joseph I, and standing by my bed, they framed you on a murder charge, says Joe, but I'm dead, says Joe, but I'm so I, I don't have the same baritone, but I sing that to my to my sons. But I changed the last verse from Seattle all the way to Maine and everyone in the middle. But uh, talk about his his labor radicalism and socialism. Absolutely, you know it's interesting. This is a um, this is a book by Charles Wright. All the Detroiters know the Charles Wright Museum. It's one of the oldest African American museums in the in the country. It's called Robeson, Labor's Forgotten Champion. And of course, the folks in Detroit, and their pictures in here, Paul Robeson with Coleman Young when he was a state senator. Uh, he worked with the National Negro Labor Council. You know, I mean, remember, Robeson is at the height of his popularity in the 40s when A. Philip Randolph and them threatened to shut Washington down if you don't desegregate these jobs in the military. And Executive Order 8803, of course, we know comes out of that World War II. Robeson's in that fight. That Fair Employment Practices Committee that comes out of that, Anna Hegeman, who helps lead that fight, you know, he's in the middle of that labor fight. And he always saw, he worked particularly with the Congress of Industrial Organizations. And he's fighting against racism in the unions. But at the same time, he's also saying, we have working class solidarity that's global. So, of course, we didn't even get a chance enough. We won't, you know, we obviously have a few minutes tonight. But, you know, his... um the films of which he was most proud. And we know Robeson stopped his film career when he said, I can't really play the roles I wanna play. One of them, of course, is the Proud Valley, where he you know, is in solidarity with the Welsh miners. That's what endears them to him and him to them. But his notion of global solidarity movements built in the trade union movements is really at the core of his work. And it's funny because Dr. Wright, who was a medical doctor who started this museum in his house, he's got a chapter in there called Robeson and the song Joe Hill. <laughs> so he, he, he's talking about how, you know, this notion of global solidarity doesn't have race at, at the foundation of its logic. In other words, we, he, Robeson doesn't care what color you are, but I'll, I'll end with this. He is absolutely an African. In other words, he's a pan-Africanist, he's anti-colonial, but he believes that it's almost like he's a cultural internationalist and an integrationist at the same time. It's the best example. He says, everybody has something to give to a human understanding, but there's a commonality underneath, which is one of the reasons he started studying all those languages. He says, I'm noticing this, the similarities between tree and Yoruba and the way we speak in the United States as African people, but I'm also seeing these similarities in these European languages and then some of the Asian languages. Underneath the languages is commonality. And I think, I think his attitude toward labor his attitude toward the working class, his statements consistently about the fact that it is labor which allows us to have these societies that people are exploiting these, the poor with. He says that is a solidarity that can, can, must be the foundation of, of, of our modern societies. So, yeah, he was thoroughly committed to, to the labor movement. Mm. 
That's so beautiful. Just the way he was able to weave together the struggle for black liberation with, with a common struggle for all humanity and a working class movement uh, is one, a lesson I hope we can recover, not only to teach about in our classrooms, but also to organize ourselves uh, yes. in our unions and yes. our teachers in our educator unions and, and beyond. So oh. I hope we, <laughs> that's, uh, that's, the ne that's the next stage. Um, but, you know, I think in response to uh, that, I want to say that um, I think that in many ways, the politics of people like Paul Robeson being marginalized by the far right, you know, the McCarthyist attacks, are, are very visible, but I think also, you know, he was marginalized by liberals and, um, you know, by other people in the civil rights struggles. Uh, and I think today uh, we also have a problem where liberals and Democrats discredit radical organizers. Um, we're seeing a struggle inside the Democratic Party today uh, I think that's uh, highlights some of that. So I wonder if you could comment on that. Oh yeah, very quickly. I, I think I'm probably not the only one in our room tonight who chuckled a little bit when uh, uh, President-elect Biden, when he was accepted the nomination, opened his speech by quoting Ella Jo Baker. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, here we go. Uh, how far are you going to go with Ella Jo Baker, who of course was a great comrade along with uh, Claudia Jones and our, uh, of, of, of the ropes. And so I'm like, yeah, you don't really want that smoke, bro. Because, <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, it's interesting, isn't it? You see somebody like John Lewis, for example, new ancestor, who said he made a point to meet Paul Robeson because Robeson, of course, had been, he finally got his passport back in 58. They traveled around, came back. Essie makes transition just as the civil rights movement is really no young people move. But John Lewis said, I want to meet, please, thank you. Thank you for everything you've done. But people see he's not, say he's not connected, but that same John Lewis, along with uh, Jim Clyburn and some of the folks who were involved in SNCC from the beginning, you know, here we are in 2020. And here's Congressman Clyburn, a deep comrade of, 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 of Congressman Lewis, and a man who traces back to what was going on around Orangeburg and South Carolina State, who went to South Carolina State, saying, don't be talking about defunding the police, and he said, we got to be in this, this, this is This is the danger. And finally, what I'll say is, you know, what Paul Robeson represents, what Essie Robeson represents, is the fact that when you have a platform, you know, young people now, they talk about platform. When you have a platform like that, you can inspire people by the choices you make, which is why he writes in Here I Stand, I Had No Alternative. He says, you know, you can inspire people to make different life choices. That is extremely unsettling to the political apparatus that is built on keeping those people powerless. And right. then the liberals, black, white, or otherwise, have a decision to make. Because if you don't think we can all win, you think you're doing the best deal you can get. But it starts with, you don't think we can win, do you? So I don't even look at it as, oh, y'all sell out. No, you don't think people can win. So you think you're actually doing us a favor. Robeson lived his life in a way to show you don't have to compromise. I put a lot on his father, you know, a lot of that on his family. But when you don't compromise, you threaten not only the structure, but those who think you have to compromise. And by compromise, I mean you have to accept something than uh, something less than everybody should have somewhere to sleep. Everybody should have the dignity of labor. Everyone should be able to have health care and education. If you don't think that's true, you just start cutting deals. And I think that's where the liberals are. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's incredible. I think what you said about how someone with a platform really scares the establishment, right? And but. At the same time, Paul Robeson knew that the change wasn't going to come from from him alone or or a collection of people with a platform, but by by the masses of people. But but I see an echo today with like Colin Kaepernick using his platform like that terrified the establishment that that this religion of football on Sunday uh, that was a shrine to American patriotism could get upset and that uh, that could become a platform for radicalism as well. So, I mean, I see how Robeson brought radical ideas to the mainstream in, in a similar way, so. Well, and can I you imagine, I mean, 
he, you see what they did. We we see what they did to uh to Cap. I haven't seen a down of football since. But right. imagine, it, imagine not even Kaepernick, but at his time, Ropes and the Rutgers is a two-time All-American, plays f- pro football on the weekends. Uh-huh. <laughs> you know what I mean? When he gets when he going to law school, beats yeah. Jim Thorpe's team. That's a whole nother conversation about who Jim Thorpe is, right? This guy is the baddest athlete in the country and the baddest actor, one of the baddest at in the world, and yeah. one of the top two or three recording artists in the, so it's like, okay, put LeBron James with Drake <laughs> with I mean, you know what I'm saying? And then says and you all, I'm for everybody. In fact, I'm going to stop singing for two years and all he said, no more pretty songs. <laughs> oh, wait a minute, hold on. So you imagine you know, the biggest, let's say, I don't, you name it, coming up saying, you know what? No more pretty hip hop. Mm. No more. I'm going to like, wait a minute. What mm. is this guy doing? When a guy like that, to, to repurpose finally what they say about Dave Chappelle now, except this is like, for real, doesn't even compare. A guy like that's too big to cancel. Mm. You can't cancel him. The only thing you do is take his passport. Why? Because if, <laughs> if you want to beef with him, he's on a plane. Next thing you know, they named a mountain for him in the Soviet Union. Now he's in China. Where's this guy? Now he's in England. You know what? Take the guy's passport. Mm. And they still couldn't break him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, right? Another level. Not just Kaepernick, but mixed with LeBron and Drake. I love No that. question. I love you said that. Like, that's why you know, they have take his passport right mixed he, with tom hanks and denzel i mean say yeah yeah uh that's on another level another level man uh well um there's a couple more questions but we're coming to the time i really this is a, such a rich conversation to launch uh our our study small small groups here and yeah. so i think we'll move to our small groups here in just a moment I'm loving uh, the chat too. People like the Jackie Robinson piece. I saw the Paul Robeson folk, the Robeson House. If y'all don't know, y'all got to check them out. The Robeson House. Uh, hey, uh, shout out to Chris from the Robeson House in Philly. No question. And oh, I see Ra- Rabbi Hello. I'm with you, brother. Ballot for Americans. That and the house I live in, that should be on endless loop. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we can listen to some of those uh, at the end of the program too today for sure. Right. This is exactly uh, right. So. Well, the, you know, we have people from the UK here with us today yes. across the pond. So shout out to y'all for staying up late and uh, joining us with, in this session. It's past midnight there. Um, so I just thought, you know, it's an incredible opportunity to just say that you can learn a lot from us here about his life, but also there's a lot in the UK to learn about Paul Robeson. Maybe you just want to say a word about his relationship to oh. the UK. Oh, of course. Um, you know, it's interesting. Um, Robeson is 30 years, well, 32 years old when he gets that role. I and mean, we know he's born 1898 in Princeton. Um, you know, he grows up in Somerville, goes to Rutgers on a scholarship, Phi Beta Kappa there, goes to Columbia Law School, gets married to Essie. Now, Essie is like, hey, man, you need to maybe look at this stage stuff. So he starts in the black theater, the colored wise. Then he comes over and gets on Broadway uh, and he does, you know, shuffle along, things like that. Now, He's going to jump the pond in 1930 and go play Othello, which is still the longest running engagement of Othello in England. It's like, wow. And he, this isn't, you know, Ira Aldrich had preceded him in the 19th century, but now he's really bigger than ever. And while he's there, he and Essie, which is what she's writing in African uh, Journey, they start dealing with the, the Africans there, meeting the African students. Uh, he starts making movies. He films Saunders of the River. He's not quite satisfied because they mess him up. It's, he thinks it's one thing. It's going to be another thing. He then makes another movie, Song of Freedom. He's meeting who's in England at the time. Yomo Kenyatta, Namde Zikiwe. A lot of these young students are going to end up leading their countries to liberation and liberation struggles in Africa. And I guess the folks who are joining us from the UK, I mean, Liverpool, that's where a bunch of those boats ended up. I mean, I might have come, my people may have come over one of them boats that came out of Liverpool. Because, <laughs> of course, that's where, that's where a lot of the ships came from. But the young brother from London, you know, you're there. This is the beauty of the technology. You can go into archives once this thing lifts and look at SOAS, the School of Oriental and African Studies. That's where Paul Robeson is studying the languages. That's where Re- Essie is digging around in the archives. That's where the West African Student Union basically make them adopted continental Africans, which paves the way when Essie ends up going to the continent. All that stuff's in the London archives. I mean, they live over there for over a decade. 
you know, they, they bring, you know, uh, Essie's mother over with Paul Jr. And, they say, and then they come back to the United States. And so, you know, and then, of course, after his passport is restored and in 57, 58, then he comes back for another engagement. So, yeah, I mean, shout out to the folks in London. This is, you know, the plague is terrible. But uh, Jeannie was, Jean Theodore Harris was saying this a minute ago. We were in our chat in our, in our breakout room. This is one of the this is one of the advantages we have with the technology. Mm -hmm. then, you know, you got to buy a plane ticket and find a place to stay. No, just click on the place. And but of course, you know, it works both ways. So are we having this conversation? See, these are master teachers that convene these things. So guess what? You get the good work reward in a minute. More work because there may be something we need you to pull out that archive and put on the web for us. <laughs> <laughs> right on. Right on. Uh, thank you for breaking down his connection with the UK. Uh, so this session goes until 715. Um, so we hope you can stay. But if you have to leave early, make sure you fill out the evaluation and there'll be a link in the chat below. Um, but we're going to keep taking questions. If you have a question, uh, please put, this is a, a great opportunity. Please drop it in the chat and we will try to get to it. Um, I see there's a couple questions in the chat about um, labor solidarity and um, reparations. And I, th I think uh, it would be interesting to talk about because I've heard people argue that if you're, if you're fighting for reparations and that can go against labor solidarity because uh, white workers won't like it and um, it will divide the working, it's a divisive issue that could divide the working class. And I wonder if you could respond to that and, uh, and maybe what Paul Robeson might think. Well, I think that that's actually possible if we take a narrow view of reparations. Uh, you know, there's a dimension of reparations that are cultural, that are cultural, spiritual, and that is the, the harm that was committed against, you know, people of African descent here in the United States, for example. And of course, we can't, uh, we can't, underscore, can't underscore enough the fact that there are numerous people that have been damaged as groups, Native Americans, of course, included. But if we're talking about a solidarity movement that accrues to the benefit of everyone, then we're talking about something that is going to ultimately benefit us all. So the idea that everyone has health care, everyone has education, that's a huge thing to build solidarity around. Now, that still doesn't address that psychic and cultural piece, which is why uh, Catherine Frankie in her book, Repair, for example, talks about the fact that there should be a Truth and Reconciliation commi uh, Committee in, in the United States of America. Go beyond apologies. If you look at H.R. 40, you know, you were talking about, you know, how do we address the specific harm against people of African descent? But I think finally, uh, somebody like Paul Robeson or Eslanda Robeson would never narrow that struggle to the four borders of the United States. Mm. You know, it would be part of a global solidarity movement, a global reparations movement, which is why we see, for example, in the 1940s, uh, Robeson, Alphaeus Hunton, uh, Dorothy Hunton start among with, with, with their colleagues, the Council on African Affairs. They're always talking about how the struggle here connects to struggles other places. And I think reparations will be no different. It's part of a yeah. global solidarity movement uh, on behalf of people who have been uh, been harmed. Yeah. Now, I appreciate that that global perspective. Also, I appreciate what you said about how when one section of people are lifted up, it helps everybody. I mean, we, we got to learn that lesson right now in the COVID era. Like, we're only as safe as the least insured among us, right? If people are getting sick and can't access health care, then we're all at risk. And so uh, how do we look for the most injured in our society and, and lift them up, I think. Yeah, that's uh, right. So then there's a question that someone asked about, how do we teach Paul Robeson to elementary school? <laughs> that's good, that's good. In fact, we're talking about, I'm just saying, uh, we were talking uh, when we were in our breakout room, this, this just came out. A graphic biography of Paul Robeson, Ballad of an American. Very interesting. The art and text by Sharon uh, Rudall, and it's uh, edited by Paul Buell and, and Lawrence Way. Folks know Paul Buell probably because he's, among other things, the biographer of uh, C.L.R. James. But this book doesn't skimp on the scholarship. Everything we're talking about now in term, and, 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 and a whole lot more is included in these pages. It's only about 120 pages. But as you can see, 
it's written in a kind of narrative style with the kind of engagement that it can be used as a point of departure for younger children. Um, it's not the first one. In fact, if you want to talk about maybe one for middle school students, I don't know if I brought it out here because, you know, toting all those Robeson books. There's one called Paul Robeson for Beginners. I don't know if I have it around here. But in any, oh, yeah, look at that. Here's one. Yeah. <laughs> This is a good one. <laughs> this is a good one as well. I mean, it's got, but it, but it's a little bit more like seventh grade, eighth grade, a lot of narrative and photographs. But I love the graphic novel format because, again, and I would say finally, not just for children, but for any age. It's a, it's a nice point of entry with a good bibliography. And I think that, uh, oh, well, I should say this as well. A lot of ways, Robeson teaches himself. Mm. You know, I, was I had a conversation about a month ago with uh, some jazz musicians. We were having a conversation and uh, talking about creativity. And Robert Glasper, the, the jazz musician, said that as as an infant, he used to play Nat King. He and his wife played Nat King Cole for their son. He's an infant. He said they would play it. He'd go to sleep. they turn it off. He'd wake up. He's no, no. He's, he loves now. He's now he's like a teenager. He lo start playing Paul Robeson. <laughs> y'all know y'all didn't want Deborah to turn that music off. I didn't. And I'm going to have to play some of it when we get off this call. <laughs> you know what I'm exactly. Let, let the music be a point of entry for the, I mean, wow. I'm now mm -hmm. thinking about some of his, uh, was this Proud Valley? Or was it Lazy Bones sleeping in the bed? In fact, Paul <laughs> Robeson Jr. said, I'm ashamed to admit, but as a child, my favorite wasn't uh, Deep River. My favorite wasn't Old Man River. My favorite was uh, Mammy's Little Baby Love Shortening, Shortening. <laughs> I mean, Paul Jr. said, I mean, now, you know, and Robeson, there's a whole critique of Robeson's music and theater appearances in, the, in Garvey's paper, in the Negro world. He's not going unchallenged, but that voice, he could be singing out the telephone book. Children <laughs> going to know, as, as Harry Balifante says, you sing, Robeson told me, you sing their song, they're going to want to know who you are. I think that would apply to children too. No, oh, I hear that. That sounds like a joyful now enter the conference. Right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> no doubt. No doubt. We're, we have a little bit more time. So if anybody has last questions, can everyone double check that you're muted? Dr. Give us hope. here tonight. Let me see. Did I help? Yeah, yeah, we're good. We're good. I didn't know anything about Zoom until we started teaching and now doing it <laughs> six classes a week. <laughs> the mute all. I, so I see in the chat, it's a lot of uh, the progressive part of the progressive part. Oh, Robeson and King and communism. Yes, I wanted to talk about that, please. Yeah, yeah we should say, we should just say very quickly that, of course, Essie did it first in 53. Paul followed in 56 in his testimony before the House Un American Activities Committee. It Paul says, none of your business whether I'm a member of the Communist Party or not. And this is part, this is why we have these protections, these constitutional protections. But Dr. King, very interestingly, near the end of his, particularly toward the end of his life, King, oh, by the way, parenthetically, of course, people often refer to uh, Martin Duberman's biography of Robeson. And it's a good place. It's got a lot of facts in here, but there's so many different things. And a lot of Robeson's people, his son, Lawrence Brown, a lot of people wrote biographies, so I would read them all if you have a chance. But Malcolm X, at the funeral of Lorraine Hansberry, asked Paul Jr., they were in Harlem, he said, can I meet your, can I meet your father? And so they went up and said, okay, well, maybe another time. He does, he does admire you because, you know, Paul, this is 1965. I see, you know, so Malcolm's assassinated before they can get together. They're mm -hmm. all kind of ties. In the 75th anniversary, here's the 75th birthday program for Paul Robeson. The great artist Charles White did the cover. And the committee included Harry Belafonte, Dizzy Gillespie, Alice Childress. Pablo Neruda writes a poem, a tribute to Paul Robeson in this program. But the, oh. reason, the reason I bring it up is because the son of Elijah Muhammad, Warf D. Muhammad, who's now with the Nation of Islam, sends condolences when Paul Robeson passes the year uh, in 1976. The, the Martin King isn't one thing. He honors W.E.B. Du Bois at a moment after Dr. Du Bois has been uh, ostracized. He sees Paul Robeson as a major figure in this solidarity movement. King is not, in fact, 
King's unpopularity arguably is because he embraces a, another common world, a common common global solidarity movement. You know, not post 65 as much as he probably was always there. Remember, he goes to Ghana in 1957, he and uh, uh, Coretta Scott King at the invitation of Kwame Nkrumah. Uh, the United States writes narrative and builds curriculum in ways to keep us thinking within the four border, four corners of this border, these borders. Yeah. yeah. And so I wouldn't trust anything coming out of convention conventional curriculum about anybody when you start talking about liberation movements. Because it's simple, it's because the, the reality doesn't match up to the narratives. I mean, that's one reason why y'all working so hard, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. exactly. That's why we keep adding lesson plans as fast as we can <laughs> to the website. Yes, sir. Oh, no doubt. We got a couple good questions coming in. Um, so I'll give you a couple and, and we'll see what we have time for here. Somebody, uh, oh, Turquoise asked about speaking about Paul Robeson and how they didn't attend an HBCU. And then somebody asked about, can you speak to uh, the black political elite turning their backs on, on Robeson? Do the first one very quickly. You know, it's interesting, Robeson got honorary degrees from HBCUs, two of them, uh, Morehouse, Howard. In fact, uh, Benjamin Mays' remarks at the uh, granting of the, um, of the honorary degree is actually included in the 75th birthday program. Uh, so, but at the time, you know, Paul Robeson was from Jersey and uh, his principal at the time, when, when, they, when, they, when he was coming out of high school, the white principal didn't tell him about this state, state exam they were gonna take. Uh, the exam, if you scored near the top, you could get free entry into Rutgers. Robeson was the top scoring high school student in the state of New Jersey, and he went to, went to Rutgers for free. Then he made the football team, came an All-American, and Phi Beta Kappa. It wasn't, I think, and of course, his people are from Robeson, North Carolina, by the way. In fact, that's where his father escaped enslavement and then joined the Union Army. So I don't think Robeson would not have gone to an HBCU. And he certainly understood the value of them. And he had degrees from a couple of them, honorary ones. Essie, interestingly enough, you know, Frances Cardozo, her grandfather ends up being the superintendent of colored schools in D.C. He's a very important figure. And um, when you look at Paul's, Paul's cousin, as I said, Sadie Mossel Tanner Alexander, Sadie Tanner Mossel Alexander. Sadie Alexander was from Philly, as folks at the Robeson House know. Sadie... Her family sends her to Washington to go to, arguably, I don't know, maybe maybe Howard was better, hard to say, the M Street School, which was the best high school for black people in the country. In fact, I got a couple of the yearbooks here. Um, Dunbar will become Paul Lawrence Dunbar. So there's a black educational institution theme in on both sides of the Robeson family. I think that it can't be ignored. Now, uh, the second question was about yeah, the black political elite turning oh. their back on Robeson. I think it's, it's, it, it, it seems like it's fairly straightforward. Um, you're talking about a situation where the black elite in a Jim Crow and an American apartheid system are negotiating with the white power structure, with the white elite for access. And, you know, there, there, there are legal strategies. Remember, Paul Robeson is a lawyer, technically, even though he really didn't never, ever practice. Um, but he doesn't get involved in the legal struggle in that same way. Um, he, he does lobby. They, they do anti-lynching. They did try to get an anti-lynching bill passed in the 40s. But that tiny black elite, which embraces Robeson, remember, in terms of the red carpet Negroes, Paul Robeson is the red carpet Negro. I mean, he gets the spin going award in the ACP. He's beloved by these folks. But when Robeson jumps the shark for them, meaning expands that working class solidarity internationally, the United States is entering the Cold War. And they come to this black elite and say, look, what side you going to pick? Because we'll lace you with this communist tag and all y'all be in jail. So at that point, <laughs> you know, the NAACP, you know, particularly like Walter White and them, then the they don't, they don't just throw Robeson overboard. They throw Du Bois overboard. Mm -hmm. Du Bois helped found the NAACP. They fire him again. He's in his 70s in 1940. You got to go. And so like, what are you doing? So I'm saying I have to say that we've seen this show before. We've seen the black elite tell the rest of black folk, moderate, slow down, 
There's another way to do this. So what this conversation in 2020 has its antecedents in 1950s, 1960s, all the way forward. And so, you know, I stopped short of calling people sellouts because we realized that somewhere along the way, we've been trained to think, some of us and our children are often exposed to this, that individual success translates into success for the group. And Robeson writes about this in Here I Stand. My success means nothing if we haven't moved together as a group. And when somebody like that says it, mm-hmm. well, you've got to distance yourself from them because people actually listen to Paul Robeson. Yeah. yeah, they're not listening to him because he's a politician. They're, they're listening to him because his records are in their house, because he saw their movies. And I, I should mention that as well. I, I'll end with, end with this one. Um, the Paul Robeson, when we think about Paul Robeson as a movie star in the 1920s, people talk about the Emperor Jones, all, all you know. But his first movie, 1924, I guess it was, it is with the black filmmaker Oscar Michaud body and soul <laughs> so if you want to, if you want to see somebody play a kind of schizophrenic good bad in the same watch paul robeson in oscar michaud's body and Soul. so black folk love paul robeson because uh, he enters their public consciousness not as a political figure but as a cultural icon mm-hmm. so you've almost got to and if you can't if you can't if you can't just strictly get rid of him you just stop speaking his name Mm. And a lot of the disappearance of Paul Robeson had to do with the fact that he was very, he was, he was extremely effective. So you got to just get rid of him. (laughs) Yes. Wow. So many lessons came through today. Uh, Greg, your spirit like just shone through the screen today and like lit me up. So I really appreciate you. And just so great to be with everybody here today. Please go teach somebody about paul robeson after this um, look at the robeson house they dropping all the stuff in here just jesse yeah. i want to thank you man that that access to freedom ways is very important i should mention one other one okay this is a great piece by jeffrey stewart he edited it it's called paul robeson artist and citizen excellent resource and you know zen in and i thank deborah for this all the resources we're talking about, I don't know how y'all do this, Jesse. Again, thank you, brother. My head is always off to you. But all the resources will be, they're going to have it somewhere for everybody to have. So at least the list. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you to Deborah and to Sierra and, and everybody yes. for helping make this this possible. And Greg, um, your, your stacks of books are also... <laughs> Uh, an inspiration to me because you know I'm I've run out of bookshelf room too and I I felt like well I guess I should stop getting books at this point but you you've let me know nah. I, can keep, I can keep ordering <laughs> I'll be okay <laughs> please me here brother no question <laughs> I ain't got nowhere else to put them that's funny <laughs> I love it I love it thank you for that Appreciate so we're gonna have to end this session y'all uh, thanks everybody for being here but before you go please fill out the the feedback. Um, there's the link in the chat and let us know w- what you learned and what you thought. Uh, and before doing the evaluation though, please unmute yourselves and you can share your thank yous with uh, Dr. Greg Carr. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you thank you and all the people behind this thank, thank, thank you jesse too yes thank you jesse that's thank you jesse thank you all so much maybe uh maybe deborah can send us off with some uh paul robeson's music while you're filling out the evaluation and i hope that everyone has a wonderful evening and stays in the struggle. Uh, Dr. Carr, I got a quick question Thank for you. you. Still there? Yes. Um, I, I know you're doing some work with the African American Curriculum Project in DCPS. I'd like to um, contact you about that. How can I reach out to you? Put my email in the uh, in the chat. All right, folks, man. Folks can follow Greg on Twitter as well. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yep. If anybody wants to drop any information in the chat box, we'll share that all of that with Dr. Carr and on your evaluation. Put there that you want to follow up. Where's the link to the evaluation? Yeah, I'll put it in the chat box again. Let's see, right here. It's on a Google Doc right there in the chat box.
Yeah, Zoom won't let you leave until you fill it out. <laughs> Higher. <laughs> a big shout out to all the facilitators too, because the feedback from the sessions was amazing. Yes, thank you, facilitators, helping the the breakout rooms flow. We really appreciate you. Absolutely. Big shout out to Deborah. Thank you, Deborah. Deborah. Uh, thank you. Yes. 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 Shout out to Deborah. Oh, Deborah. Oh, we rock, Deborah. Lee is here. We got Enid Lee in the house. <laughs> yes. Oh, Enid. Wow. Mm -hmm. Hi, Enid. It's a wonderful session. Dr. Oh, Carr. legend. Yes. Hi. How are you doing? <laughs> I, I got so much out of it. I, I can hardly speak. Um, I got so much. I could hardly speak. Oh, but no. it was amazing. And I will be back. Thank you very much. Good to see you. Are you Big shout out Jamaican Canadian here. Yes. <laughs> yes. And also to all the, there's a lot of facilitators from the Teaching for Black Lives Study groups too. Australia. Oh, yes. Yes. The folks are here. Yep. Uh, you know, you know, it's, it's, never, it's never far. It's never oh, far. Oh, right. oh, look at that. That warms my heart. To Come on, man. He got to sign one of these joints for Look, we got him right here. <laughs> when this plague is over, you gotta. I got to get you to sign this, bro. <laughs> you, for sure. you know, damn made sure I was laced, man. You know, I had, had a, the ammunition. <laughs> right on. Man, I think, you, I think you have a library in your home. Brother. That's about it. I sleep in the library, right? That's right. <laughs> Glad yeah. to be I heard uh, the story from about Arturo Schomburg that he uh, was collecting so many books and memorabilia that his wife said, "If you don't move this out into a museum, I'll be moving out." <laughs> right. That's right. Brooklyn. That's a Brooklyn story. Right. He had two houses. I think. <laughs> That's uh, funny, man. I think that, oh, wow, we didn't even talk about him. The sister, uh, I'm trying to remember whether, you remember when you read that? What? About, about Schaumburg. And his, I'm, I know Eleanor Sinet writes about it. She just made Transition, by the way, who wrote the book on Schaumburg, the first one. All right. Uh, not too long ago. I don't know, Deborah. do you remember? It's, it's been maybe six months, five, it was this year, I want to say. Um mm -hmm. Yeah, she was at Moreland Spengarn, uh, Moreland Spengarn and Howard for a number of years. But I think maybe the first place I may have read that was uh, Black Bibliophiles and Collectors, mm -hmm. which was the book they did uh, out of, uh, they had a Howard conference. And I didn't get a chance to talk about it today. Uh, Charles Bloxon, I used to work for Mr. Bloxon. Bloxon would go over to the Robeson house when, Mr., when uh, Paul was alive with his sister, would answer the door and see whether he could come in or not, or anybody could come in. But Bloxon has a bust a neck up bust that was caught where well, was sculpted by Anthony Salemi. Salemi was the one that did the full body nude of Robeson right. that uh, they, they showed in Philadelphia. And Mr. Bloxon told me that Salemi told him, cause see, the, the thing disappeared. They don't know where the original is. Huh. They said that the, the Philadelphia, the city fathers made them take it off a of display cause the ladies of Philadelphia were going down <laughs> to, the, <laughs> to the right. And these guys were like, you can't have. But <laughs> but but Mr. Bloxon told me that Paul Robeson's sister, Marion, that that the, the 10 years Ro Robeson used to get out, you know, as, as people in the Robeson house would tell you, you know, he wasn't a complete recluse. But she would take him sometime down there to Ridden House Park over there on Walnut Street and just sit in the park. And he and he's low key, nobody was checking for him. 10 years of his life, last 10 years, because there was a time when the bronze nude of Paul Robeson uh, rewrote <laughs> the eyeballs of the uh, white citizens of Philadelphia. <laughs> so, the, <laughs> so the old man used to go down there and sit in the sun. <laughs> oh, no, yeah, but Mr. Bloxon has a bust of himself, because he's a Robeson. He's, a Robeson is his man. But Tony Salemi, who made that, that sculpture, sculpted Mr. Bloxon's head as well. We didn't get a chance to talk about that. <laughs> so, um, Thank you for the for the footnote there. Yeah, bro. I appreciate everybody. We'll we'll close it out with some music. Y'all have a wonderful evening. We'll catch you at the next Zen Ed uh, People's Historian class online. And uh, stay strong, y'all. Stay healthy. Stay in the struggle. Y'all be careful, bro. 
Thank you. 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 What is America to me? The house I live in. Is that dry? Forever. session and we'll see everybody next month if not before. We've got Dr. Kadada Williams in December, Jean Theo Harris in January, Clint Smith in May, and more coming up in between. So uh, and please share your teaching stories. We'll send a follow-up email and if you teach using any of these resources I already do uh, about Paul Robeson, please email us so we can share those stories. Thank you and, and good evening. <laughs>